it's so nice to meet you. Uh, my name Likewise. is Galen, and yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you and talk about your book and like pick your brain and stuff. I listened to like some of your podcast episodes. Oh, so yeah. Like, oh, really cool. Okay. <laughs> um, just to forewarn you, my laptop makes these weird submarine sounds. I have no idea how to turn them off. We've tried everything. I think oh. it's just the luck <laughs> of the ball that I got. Um, so yeah, would you like to tell a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Dr. Joy Cox. Um, I am a qualitative researcher. Um, I received my PhD from Rutgers University, New Brunswick in 2018 uh, in organizational communication. And so I study the way that um, organizations communicate to the people who work there, right? If you want your um, if you want your employees to assimilate uh, the identity to kind of take on the identity of, um, of an organization. And then I also look at uh, identity in a broader context. So kind of looking at society as an organization, right? And what we do to assimilate um, or to disassimilate um, in, in, in society. And so I've been studying um, in particular as it relates to identity, fat bodies now for about, uh, 2021 geez so um <laughs> right so for about maybe i would say maybe the last uh seven and a half eight years okay. um i am a fat black woman cisgender woman um i've lived in a fat body my whole life okay. um and um as of right now i am a program development analyst at the uh at Rutgers new jersey medical school okay. uh, so i work with uh, medical students that help acclimate them to the community in the city of newark so that they can be uh, well informed about uh, the people that they will one day be treating. Awesome. That's, that's amazing. That's, oh my <laughs> gosh, it's so cool. I, I just love seeing people like thriving and like you're doing so much and it makes me happy. So that's, a, that's awesome. wonderful. So I have just a list um, here uh, and it's not like a, a hard and fast, like we have to talk about these things, but you know, I'll bring up some topics and if we stay on that great if we like wander it's a journey and I'm here to take it with you so yeah um I guess <laughs> <Am> I? <laughs> wonderful <laughs> um so uh, I was connected to you via the Broadway positivity uh body project and the Broadway body positivity project I want to make sure I get their name right mm -hmm. and um so I am a dancer and um I came across their page in like May of the pandemic. So I think we've been like following each other for a while now. Um, and so I really just love what they're doing in terms of making it so like all bodies are Broadway bodies, not just like, this is what you have to look like in order to like be on Broadway or be in this sect of, like sector of entertainment. Um, so I guess I just want to start with, um, your exploration of black bodies and fat black bodies because i think it's there those are two marginalized groups and then i think when you add womanhood on top of that it's like you're adding double layers like i know when i walk into an audition it's already like okay so they're already like oh can this black girl does she actually have technique and then it's like oh, okay but now can she dance because it's like she's bigger than some of the other people that, that come into the room so it's like you have added things stacked against you so in your research what have you found in terms of just like how those bodies move through the world yeah so exactly what you just uh what you just said right there are um you know kimberly crenshaw she coined the term intersectionality uh, and so when we think about marginalized identities, we think about the ways by which oppression is compounded. Um, so there is no sense of like picking and choosing like, oh, I'm a woman. Oh, I'm fat, right? Like, no, what does it mean to be a woman and be fat, right? What does it mean to be a woman who is black and fat, right? And so you have, um, you know, even within my own research, um, there's, a, there's a lot of extra um wait no pun intended that um black fat women deal with mm -hmm. um you know because the narratives that are written about us in society are different than other groups uh and people treat us differently based on that right um we encounter 
a different type of struggle. And I think, you know, from the way that I read Kimberly Crenshaw's work, I think that's that's the heart of what she was trying to get at, right? That there's another reality that's being lived and it can't just be, you know, about one identity when you hold multiple identities and those identities are marginalized. And okay. so, you know, there is, there's more of a struggle for sure. Yeah, some something I, I've noticed and it, it's been a while cause I haven't like gone to any auditions in person or anything, but I think even just auditioning people expect certain bodies to produce certain sounds so like like they they already expect you to like can you like make it a little blacker but it's like I should come in sounding like Mahalia Jackson every single time and when I don't they're, they're like well we don't really know what to do with you at this point because like we have this preconceived notion of how a fat black body should be presented but you're not fitting that at all um which i guess brings me to the idea of i don't know if you're familiar with we see you white american theater um but it's an organization that sprung up right around the george floyd uh protests last year and essentially it was designed to hold white theater institutions accountable for Mm -hmm. um how they present and represent not just black bodies but like all people of color and that kind of thing. Um, so is there anything that you would like to discuss just in terms of how anti-Blackness affects those, I guess, within like theater, but also like just within those, affects those within larger bodies as well? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it kind of, when you were talking, it, it reminded me of like the mammy stereotype that's often given about fat Black women. Um, And there is an expectation, again, kind of going back to what I said before about how we show up in the world and what we produce, right? And so, you know, if the idea or the stereotype around Black people and and particularly Black entertainment, uh, I think that oftentimes Black artists get um, siloed or get boxed in, right? So you have to be the sassy Black woman or you're the super soulful Black woman, right? or you're the gospel black woman, um, but there's not a whole lot of creativity as it relates to um, if you're the jazzy woman or you're the you're the funk woman, right? Or any of those things. And I think some of that speaks to the lack of imagination that rests within um, cultures like theater, right? Mm-hmm. You only see what's being put out um, and what you're expected of, um, or what people are being stereotyped as. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, I think that that's a thing, um, particularly when it comes to fat black, black women um, in theater, we are the third wheel. Yeah. We are the comedy relief, right? We are the, um, the Jennifer holidays, right? That raspy, you know, big body woman who throws herself around and she's, you know, and she's unapologetic, but at the same time, she's not, um, she's not, you know, she's not sexy. Mm-hmm. Um, she's not soft. She's not smooth, right? She's not the type of woman that you, um, that you, that she's not a love interest. Mm-hmm. She's not any of those things, right? And so I think that a lot of that deals with the lack of imagination that, um, that, that resides not just in theater, but also in, in more mainstream culture as yeah. to who Black people, Black women are and, and who, and who they should be. Yeah. Thank you. I um I've been reading your book. I'm really excited. It's on my like Look at it. list of books. This is probably like the first one I started for um not like Black History Month in particular, but my current reading list includes like a lot of works by Black authors. I'm like, okay, this is like motivation enough to like get through <laughs> some of those books. Yeah. Um, so I I like the part. Um, I'm relatively like new in it like I'm not like too deep yet but like how you're talking about you this this mammy personality was like foisted upon you early on um and I think there's even something where you say like your older sister like she makes it a point to assert that she's the oldest but it's like because of like how you were perceived like all of this was put on you so you kind of just like grew into that and that really just spoke to me because I guess it's like I always think of myself as like an awkward kind of weird person and that's like 
what I lean into when I'm like meeting new people, but people also expect certain things. Like they expect me to be funny or they expect me to be sassy. And it's like, not nah, like it's, I'm sorry, it's just not there today. <laughs> so yeah. I don't really know what to tell you. So did you want to speak um, just at all about like growing up in a personality that you felt maybe wasn't necessarily yours per se, but you had to develop out of survival or just like out of a need to do so? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, particularly as a child, when you think about the options that children have, right? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have many options, right? I was told um, this is who you're supposed to be. So it wasn't just a matter of like, oh, this personality is something that you're going to grow into, but like, this is something that you have to fulfill. Um, you know, when people stop looking to the oldest sister to do oldest sister things and look to the middle sister to do it, right? Um, you can't let your family down. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't, you know, you can't disappoint people. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I didn't get an opportunity, I guess, to grow and explore, right? Like, so wh wh what would, who would Joy be, right? If she wasn't considered the old soul, the one that was responsible for everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I didn't really get to explore that until I actually started, I moved away from home. I uh, decided to go back to school, but by that time I was 25, right? So my childhood was kind of blowing in the wind a little bit. Um, and it's not to say that my whole childhood was consumed with that, um, but a big portion of being responsible for everybody, being aged out of certain activities, um, you know, and certain things, things that nobody, like, I guess, uh, considered me for, right? So there were things that I was passed up for as a result. Um, just because it wasn't on, it wasn't, it wasn't on their radar for me. Mm -hmm. And so kind of taking, you know, getting older and being able to take some of that back and being like, no, actually I do like to do this. Like, you know, no, actually I don't want to tell a joke today. Mm -hmm. I want to be left alone. You can't come and visit me, right? Yeah. Um, this is your problem. I'll let you figure it out on your own. Um, it's something that I'm still learning because I think once that gets ingrained in you, it's very easy to jump into mammy mode, mm -hmm. right? It's very easy to be the person that comforts people. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but the obligation to have to do it, I think is what makes it problematic. Yeah. It's interesting because I, I have a younger brother, so I'm the oldest sibling mm -hmm. and, um, my younger brother I tell him all the time I'm like I get that like sports aren't your thing but bro like if you had chosen like if you had chosen to play football you would be set because like he's built like a linebacker and he's fast um but what's interesting to me is like there was never any type of assumption about his personality foisted onto him as he grew up um like he he was allowed to just like be who he was versus you know me being the oldest and also like having these other responsibilities like you talk about how like black girls are adultified for lack of a better word I don't know if that's the word you use that's the yeah. word I up yeah. just now <laughs> um, they're adultified so much sooner and I'm like that's so true like I you know me having to cover up completely after leaving a dance class while like all my other friends are like walking out in their leotards and tights and it's like well you know it's August in North Carolina it's hot why do I have to put on all these extra layers and like well we don't want people to see your body and it's like well why is my body different than their body and like I developed relatively younger compared to my friends but it's just one of those things where I don't think people really take into consideration how much is just placed on our bodies from such a young age right no for sure yeah I really appreciate you like just diving into that and covering that I was reading and I was like yes like oh my <laughs> goodness this is ah, this is also like relatable <laughs> thank you um so something I before we I'm kind of like zigzagging around a little bit um but I guess I want to look at the impact that COVID has had um, like on a wider scope on the Black community, but also on Black bodies in particular, um, and just get some of your thoughts and your insights about that. I mean, I think that 
COVID has kind of ran Russia through Black collectives. Um, we've lost a lot over the past year. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's hurtful. Um, it's hurtful. And I think that, you know, more so, um, it's also infuriating to find that the explanations that people give for why um, there are so many lives lost kind of kind of coincides with that, right? And so um, as most things work with stigma, like that responsibility is always turned back on the person. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, oh, it's high blood pressure because, you know, they don't eat right or they don't, they don't exercise enough. It's, you know, it's the fact that they are quote unquote obese and this is why, you know, they're struggling and all of these other things. And it's like, are you telling me that the white people who got lost in COVID, they were all healthy and able-bodied and like, this is an anomaly? Like, what is really going on? And so I think, you know, for me to see, you know, in the beginning when COVID first started and to see the pictures of the people who were losing their lives, um, in a lot of ways, I could see myself. Um, they look like me. They have bodies like me. Um, you know, some of the same traditions. You know, if you live in in a city, right? What it takes for you to have to go to work. What it means to be a quote unquote um, essential worker. Mm-hmm. Um, again, taking care of everyone else, um, putting yourself at risk for the sake of somebody else, and looking for help and not getting it. Um, And so there's a lot of, you know, it's messy. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that things are like easily separated. You know, how do you tell somebody who, you know, is the only person that brings an income and the country is only giving you $1,200 for a stimulus check that like you can't work, you know? I mean, the part of the parts of the black collectives that I've been a part of, like we do a lot of things and working is one of them, Um, you know, contrary to what, other people may think about black people and, and their work ethic. We gonna work. Like we if there's money to be got, we gonna get it. We're gonna find out, you know, we've learned how to make something out of nothing. Um and so, you know, I think that a lot of black people were faced with dilemmas in the process of COVID and still are. Yeah. Uh, and they made decisions and then some some in some of those decisions cost cost them their lives, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, in part because we have a, you know, a, a healthcare system that is in racist in a lot of ways, right? And, yeah. and Black people aren't getting adequate care. And whenever it counts, they're still not getting adequate care. Mm-hmm. I think anytime, and, and you can stop me because I'm good for running on tangent, oh, yeah. but um, I think anytime um, a Black doctor can record herself um, in the hospital, saying that she's not getting adequate care and then we later see that she lost her life to COVID, Mm -hmm. um, that should signal to somebody somewhere that it doesn't matter about your position and power. It doesn't matter about how much money you make, right? Like at the end of the day, when you are vulnerable and your care is in the hands of somebody else, if that system can't structurally give you what you need, like, you know, you're you're in grave danger. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's weird because my mom is a nurse. So like the first, the first month, two or three months um, when I was staying with her, it was very odd because I couldn't have like, any physical contact with her. She would come home and she would just like go into her room just to like quarantine herself. And at first I didn't get it. I'm like, why? Like, do you not want to talk to me? Like what's going on? And she's like, well, you know, a patient came in and they were exposed to COVID. So now my whole floor has to like do this or like, you know, someone came in and like this happened. So I think just for her, the stress of it all, I couldn't even begin to process. And like, I, I tell people, I, in a way, I'm not grateful for COVID per se, like, no, but the pause that it led to where it was like, we had the time to really sit and reflect on everything that was going on around us. I think that is what I am grateful for because I think if we hadn't had it, we would have just kept barreling on 
and telling ourselves that everything was fine and like you know whatever isn't fine it'll get fixed eventually but it's like no like now we have time to fix it so let's fix it yeah. um, so that's that's kind of where I am I as we approach March I'm like oh this is this has been a journey and I don't even yeah. know what time is anymore um but yeah I just I think I am humbled once I rise above the frustration of it all, I think I'm humbled to be able to be in a period of time that is so significant um, for so many people and to watch it play out in real time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ooh, sorry, got a little heavy there for a second. <laughs> um, so I want to talk to you about your book that I'm, there we go, <laughs> that I am like, <laughs> super excited about um what led to you to write it was it was it like a, a passion project that you always wanted to write was it a culmination of a few things did you feel like there's something inside of me that like just needs to get out and this is the time to do it so yeah I mean I think it was a little bit of all those things combined um actually while I was writing my dissertation I thought to myself boy it would be great to write a book then I wouldn't have to chop up my dissertation into a bunch of articles. Um, and I had done, um, I tell this story because I always think that it's really interesting. I had done a piece in Huffington Post, um, what I was featured in and was called, called Everything That You Know About Obesity Is Wrong. Yeah, I don't know. And there was like two sentences of me. There was a big picture, but there was like two sentences of my story. And, you know, it came out and people were excited about it and everything. And then I got an email from North Atlantic Books. Um, and the, at first I thought it was spam. I was like, whatever, do you want to write a book? Ha! Like, you know, <laughs> get out of my inbox. Um, and then for some reason or another, like I kind of circled back to it and I read it. And I was like, let me just see what this is. And then I reached out and then I found out like it was really a book offer. Um, and they were like, you know, we've seen your work in the Huffington Post piece. And I thought to myself, what work? Because there was two sentences in there. Um, but okay, we'll, we'll go with this. Uh, and from that, um, you know, I was like, wow, okay. Well, I said I wanted to write a book. So here's the opportunity to do so. So there was this, you know, there was part of this was about function, mm -hmm. being able to work smarter and not harder, write this book, get the stuff from your dissertation out. Um, and then there was this other piece of um, kind of what you spoke about, um, being able to share your thoughts and your feelings. Because one thing about academic writing is that it's kind of dry. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't really allow for um, you to really uh, expound on how you felt, how you thought, what it meant, how you want to write, all of those things. And I said, so here's my opportunity to do that too. Uh, and so, you know, being able to do that and then also leaning on, on uh, some of the interviews that I did for my podcast and kind of just sharing, I think it's always been you know, a desire of mine to create a platform for individuals where they could share their story. And this is something that we need to know more about. Um, and so I was like, well, I have all the pieces, like, why not do it? It'll be fun. Come on, that sort of thing. And so I jumped, I jumped, I took a leap in doing it. Um, and it was really great. I mean, it was a great type of, um, it was a great experience. Um, I had help, yeah. which, you know, I was like, oh, wait, you know, they were like, oh, your publicist will talk to you. I was like, my publicist, wait a minute. Like <laughs> I get one of them like for free, like this is great. So um, just being able to work and kind of see how all of that stuff, um, how it plays a part in, in producing something and bringing something to life. And so it was great. Yeah, that's kind of where it kind of stemmed from though. Um, function and passion. Okay, something yeah. that I, I really enjoy um, I felt like I was talking to you, like reading the book or it wasn't like, you know, I'm going to sit here and present to you these. I was like, oh, she was like real, like, okay. <laughs> I think what's funny is like, I was, I was reading it and then I was um, just trying to find like more information so that I wouldn't come in just like, I don't know, like, you know. And so I found out about your podcast and I'm like, yep. Yeah, she sounds exactly like how I thought she would sound. She sounds like a lot of such a great job of like imbuing yourself into mm -hmm. what you're writing. And so that way I'm excited to read more about it versus it 
being like, well, I started this book, so let me finish it. Mm-hmm. So I think that in itself was just a gift. So like, oh, have- thanks. you're welcome. That makes so, so yeah. <laughs> is, is there anything that was hard for you to write about or like, or was harder than you were anticipating? Yeah. So I think there was a couple parts in the book where I was like, that's enough for today. Like, let's take a step back. Um, some of it was uh, when I wrote about my childhood, that was something um, kind of reliving like my gram being part of that, um, being part of my story like that was something um, and it's been 21, well, 20, 20 years since she's been gone. Okay. Um, but just just like, yeah, like I think when you're a kid, you don't really count the days and the time. Um, and I think one of the big things that hit me is that when I was writing about my gram, I had to calculate from the time that I heard her say that she was diagnosed with diabetes mm-hmm. up until the, the year that we lost her. And it was only 10 years. Wow. And it like messed me up, right? Yeah. Like, because to me as a kid, like it felt like I had my gram around for forever, mm-hmm. um, but we really didn't. Uh, and so like that, you know, that was definitely... Um, that was definitely a lot. I think a lot of the things that like pertain to me personally, because you remember, like you remember the smell of the room, you remember what people said. And, and with that comes like the feelings, yeah. uh, what they said it, how that made you feel and, um, you know, and taking a step back. And then there were like good things. Like I kind of talked about um, one of the relationships that I had and like, you know, I remember like, you know, the euphoria around <laughs> around all of that stuff you know and kind of the excitement of that and and what that was like and and that was good um but yeah childhood stuff was super hard yeah super hard to write about I had to be like that's enough take a step back yeah um you know take some breathers and and then come back and, and write some more if you want to cool well thank you for sharing that I'm I'm also sorry about your grandma's passing, um, but thank you for like being open enough to include that in there with with your story. Cause I think it at least helps makes, not I don't wanna say relatable, but it at least like gives us a piece of you that is probably very integral to who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, so thank you for including that. Um, the There's a part that you talk about where you become aware of when your body is different Mm -hmm. and I was thinking about that in my car on my way home from work I'm like when did I become aware that like my body was different and so what do you have to say about like that light bulb moment or like that aha moment where it's like hmm like something isn't quite the same here yeah I mean I think some of it like because I think I was made aware of it when I was a kid like a lot of things didn't click um and so it's almost like it's almost like when you play a video game and okay so in the 80s I was a big Nintendo I was a kid but I was like Nintendo was my thing um and before the memory cards happened I'm aging myself but it's okay before the memory cards happened like Nintendo had created something where you could like save the game you can go go to sleep you save the game and then you start back where you left off okay so we didn't have that so I was one of the kids that stayed up all night to solve Super Mario Brothers. And so part of this, before we learn how to skip to other castles and other levels, all this stuff, was that you had to go through, you know, each round, right? You hop through, you know, the mushrooms, whatever. You're swimming, you're doing all of these things. And then, you know, you would defeat this makeshift King, King Koopa. And then you would find out that your princess is in another castle. And so I think for me, um, a lot of my childhood, like coming into the knowledge that things were different was kind of like that, right? Like I was going to these different castles and then finding out information and then going to a different level and finding out information. And so um, when I'm first notified that my body is different, it's my dad and I'm four, Mm -hmm. right? So I'm like, what? What do you mean? Like, you know, for me, I'm focusing more on the fact that it's about like, it's the lift, right? Yeah. So I'm like, well, how come I can't keep getting this fun time with the lift? Like right. daddy, something got to give, right? And so I'm not thinking in ways of like internally, something's wrong with me. 
Mm -hmm. right? I'm like, okay, well, how come I can't get the lift? Like, I'm not like, you know, looking around. But as I'm getting older, things are starting to unfold, right? And people are making comments and people are saying things about my size and saying things about my weight, right? And then there are pushes to get me to do different things, right? Um, with the assumption that I'm not already doing those things. And so I'm starting to put pieces together that, oh, people who are shaped like me, they think that I'm not moving my body. Mm -hmm. Um, people who are shaped like me, they think that I'm not eating vegetables. Mm -hmm. People who are shaped like me, um, they don't think that I'm attractive. People that are shaped like me, they don't think that I'm smart. Mm -hmm. They don't think that I have anything to say. They don't think that I know anything about my own body because if I knew something about my body, why would I treat it this way? Um, people that are shaped like me, um, you know, have a wonderful relationship with the Lord, but this one thing they can't seem to get a hold of. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there were different points and times in my life where those things become glaring and at times like super overwhelming, right? Yeah. I kind of talk about in the book where I took the family picture where I taped myself. Yeah. Like packaging tape, right? I go through school the whole day in the morning, I taped my stomach right but that's that comes from or that stem from being made aware that people that have stomachs like me mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. don't want to be in a picture like that right yeah. um and so I think there were different points and times in my life where it's like a big warning sign and I think you know over time there were times where it led me to panic so I would jump in and do things right so that's dieting and that's you know, that's working out more, that's taping yourself, that's doing whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think over time, the flip side of like acceptance, because I'd be lying if I said those things still don't happen, right? Um, acceptance happens and it's like, okay, what are you going to do, right? Like that thing, that thing glares and it's like, you could, <laughs> like you could vegetables, like you could hit a, a 900 calorie diet. You could do a 1200 calorie diet. You could work out six days a week, but now there's extra knowledge, right? That kind of comes in and says, yeah, but we know what that gets us. So what do we want to do, right? Like, what do you want to do with these actions? Do you need to go stand in front of the mirror and look at yourself and until things normalize again? Because mm -hmm. that's one of the practices that I took. Like, no, just stand here. Yeah. Just stand here and look at yourself. And you're going to realize that your arms look like everybody else's arms. Your belly looks like everybody else's. It's bigger, but it's not deformed. Mm -hmm. It's not different, right? Um, and I think part of what society does is sells us this lie that because you're bigger, you're a monster, right? Like you're subhuman. Like, yeah, like what you have on your body is like inhumane, yeah. right? So when you're looking at yourself, you're not actually looking at a human. When you're looking at yourself, like you're looking at something that's deformed or out of place. And so I stand there until it normalizes and we're good. And we take some deep breaths, right? Mm -hmm. And then I get some fruit snacks and I go sit down. Like that's, that's kind of how it, you know, how it works. And I move my body and I'm active and I eat what I eat. And, you know, and through it all, you know, I, I snow under my covers and I say, I regret nothing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Thank I you. guess that was a long way around no, your that, thing. That's but like yeah. really beautiful. Cause I think something like with dancing, you're in a mirror for so uh -huh. long, like you're in a mirror for a rehearsal or just like to work on things that it's like staring at your body. It's like, okay, I'm normal again, but then now I'm zooming in on this part here. So I don't even know what this looks like anymore. And it's just like an ongoing, like I've been in rehearsals where like, I'm like standing there and I watch my body go, woo, woo, and I'm like, I have, I don't know if this is real. I have no idea like what's going on. Um, so, you know, I, I go into auditions sometimes just like completely covered up in like the baggy sweatshirt I can find. Cause I'm like, I need something to distract myself from what I look like, because otherwise I'm not going to be able to perform at my best. Like, I know that you say come in in form fitting. No, nah, that's not going to work today. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I need something to like take my mind off of what's happening in the mirror so I can like give you the best version of me. And then if you want to book me, I'll take the sweatshirt off and we'll see what it is. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, but that's, that's really powerful. So thank you. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I think like, you know, part of that is like, where does that come from? Mm-hmm. I mean, I spent a lot of time like unpacking, right? Like, so even while I'm in the mirror, like, oh, I had somebody, it's in the book. I had somebody tell me like that my legs look like tree trunks. Mm-hmm. And it took me, <laughs> yeah, tree trunks. Um, it took me years to like, when I looked in the mirror that I did not see tree trunks. Mm -hmm. Now, logically in my mind, I knew that my legs were not tree trunks, right? right? I knew that. Mm -hmm. Um, but seeing, you know, two larger brown stalks of something, Mm -hmm. right. That didn't have a whole lot of definition. Um, how are you going to get over this? Right. Like joy is not wearing shorts outside. Joy is not you know, you're not doing why, because you feel like my legs look like tree trunks. Yeah. Um, and I had to stand on like, I'm packed. Well, why do you think that your legs look like tree trunks? Like, and this is me having a conversation with myself. Mm-hmm. Why do you feel like your legs look like tree trunks? Well, because so-and-so said this, that, and the other, but you know, your legs aren't tree trunks, right? Yes, that I know. So why don't you like your legs? Well, because they don't look like this. And it kind of goes, you know, it's like, Mm-hmm. taking off layers of clothes right yeah. um because we do um people tell you things and then when you look in the mirror that's what you see mm-hmm. um you know and it took a lot of me sitting with myself unpacking sometimes through tears sometimes through you know those pains well if I don't lose weight then am I gonna find somebody that's gonna love me for who I am like what am I you know and all of these fears But then you also ask yourself, okay, but where do those fears come from? Mm -hmm. Are those Mm -hmm. fears that you've always had? Or did somebody say something or do something that made you feel that way? If it's not yours, take it off. Right. Right. And and that was something like I had to remind myself of. I ain't saying it still don't happen. It happens, you know, (laughs) but I have to remind myself. If it ain't yours, take it off. Don't belong to you. Let somebody else care. Not somebody else. Throw it away. Burn it. Right. Um, the hope is that it disintegrates into nothing. And then the only thing that's standing there that you see is acceptance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Cause listen, like I, I've been, I've been there like in the summertime, like Jalen, it's hot. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm gonna keep on this like hoodie, you know, I'm good. Um, right. And I'm like, like, what is the cruel irony in being someone who like, loves clothes loves design I'm currently like living in a costume shop at the moment like love love clothes (laughs) and I'm sitting here like but clothes don't look good on me and it's like okay but Jalen like you can like obviously you know you can find clothes that look good on you so that's that's a really powerful sentiment and that actually kind of brings me um to my next point so kind of backtracking a little bit or curving back Mm -hmm. around is this um this weird anti-fat bias in theater where it's like only certain bodies can be certain characters and I've heard it put so many different ways where it's like well you know we have to think about the costume or blah 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 and it's like well I have clothes that fit so I don't think it's a costume issue like if I can, if I didn't show up naked to the audition, obviously there are clothes that fit me. So what is like, what is the real reasoning behind you only wanting to show certain bodies in certain positions, you know? Yeah. And I think like some of that, like, you know, the saying about like life imitates art. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's reciprocal. Right. And so what happens in mainstream society often shows up in mainstream theater mainstream entertainment right and then people look at that and they say oh this is reality and so they replicate it Mm -hmm. so I think that um you know the anti-fat bias that that resonates or that rests in in theater and entertainment is part of the bigger issue that we see in society it's just a lot more concentrated and I think the difference is that they have an audience Mm -hmm. by design Right. And so, you know, if, you know, if we think about love stories, if we think about Disney, right, in your mind, like, that's what you feel like. Your Prince Charming or, you know, your Princess Charming is going to show up and, you know, kiss you or whatever. Like, you're going to, you're supposed to be spellbound, yeah. mesmerized. Like, that's how love works, right? You know, um, I think about the Little Mermaid and they do like the kiss the girl. Whoa, whoa. Like, that's what you want, right? Like, that's the reality of like 
when you think about love, you're like, this is what I need, like in my life, right? And I think that we are, as a society, jaded in a number of ways when it comes to theater, love being one of them. Yeah. But then you pick a particular character, right? Mm -hmm. So the man has to be strong. He nine times out of 10 has to be taller. Mm -hmm. right he has to he has to show muscles he got to show strength he he doesn't back down from a challenge and then you have this woman who's small and she's dainty you know and then you're supposed to lift her up over thresholds and all of this other stuff um and I think that that is one that's a lie (laughs) but but the audience is so drawn in right that when they leave they do their best to replicate art Mm-hmm. right so now we have men that go out what are we we are 12 days away from valentine's day mm-hmm. we have men who are going to go out and they're going to buy these roses women are going to buy these roses right um we have individuals who are going to go out and they're going to do all of these things to show their love right the hope is that something is blossoming the hope is that something becomes magical um but where does that come from that comes from somebody telling you a story that this is how love works right Right. And so what's really interesting, um, you know, to me is that uh, on my social media, right, I have now I see the posts that come up that say, you know, women don't want flowers. They want wings like chicken wings, yeah. right? buffalo wings instead. Right. Like, you know, you see the, the skewers of like <laughs> of, of different things and like women are like, this is like what I dreamed of. Right. And I'm sure men are like, what? Like, what is this? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think like those are the two difference, the two differences in reality, right, that you have. You have what's really wanted and what's really happening and you have this picture that's being painted. Mm -hmm. And because theater is designed to have an audience, they are telling a story that then the people who watch that story try to go out and they, they go out and they replicate it. And so if you think picture perfect, right, which relates to a larger society, right, so you have your Eurocentric beauty standards, and all of those things, that's what theater is putting in front of you. And that picture does not include fat people um, outside of fat people being ridiculed Mm -hmm. um, or treated in a way that they are subservient to the main characters. And so I think, you know, from a larger picture of what happens in, in, in our culture and in society, theater takes pieces of that and targets it and then everybody watches, and then people leave, and they say, oh, I don't never want to, to be, oh, did you see that fat person? Oh, that, but she, but she was just funny, so, so you'll find a lot of thin friends who go and get fat friends, mm-hmm. like, yeah. we see that, right, but, oh, yeah, yeah girl, ha, 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 you're funny, but, but let a fat girl dress up, dress out, go with all them, all the smaller friends, mm-hmm. and draw attention, you will see tension form in part because nobody's ready for that right (laughs) Right? like you're not playing your role you're supposed to be the ditzy friend why'd you show up in this bodycon dress right so you know when we think about the advances that are made for fat people like this is what you have and a lot of that deals with status and a lot of that deals with power and um and when those things are challenged then you have issues so it yeah. doesn't it doesn't surprise me that there's an anti-fat bias in theater because it holds the status quo where it is. Yeah. Um, the same reason why you don't see so many films that cater to black people and black audiences outside of what's stereotypical because it holds the status quo, right? So if black people could be your next Tom Cruise or um, I don't know, the other famous your next your next Jennifer Aniston or, or yeah. somebody like that, right? then what does that say to what we call the elite mm-hmm. in Hollywood, right? Uh-huh. And nobody's, nobody knows when I had that conversation. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. I Listen, I want to have the conversation all the time. Like, <laughs> yeah. Take it apart. Um, I guess one more thing before we kind of like come into like a, a wrapping it up, I guess, so to speak. Um, so you talk about this, this sense of like status and like elite and like, um, art imitating life and so forth. And I guess what I'm trying to like make my way to is where does misogynoir find its place in that? And especially within the black community. Cause I, I saw a post on Instagram the other day 
and I saved it because I was just going to be messy and go back and read the comments because that's what I do on Instagram. <laughs> like I just like scroll through the comments. Um, and it was this, this girl who, it's so weird because I'm like, I feel like fatness within the black community. I'm like, okay, but what are like, cause you have like thick and then you have like thick. And I'm like, I don't like, I don't know. It's just such a weird um, construct. I say all that to say though, she had like made this post where it's like, yeah, I'm fat, but and then like she listed all of these things that she she did for her partner. And a lot of the comments were like, you know, well, she's not really fat or like she's not really this. And someone said, right, but the problem is that you treat fat black women a certain way that they think that they have to put themselves in a position of servitude in order to be appreciated. So that's why she made the post. And I it just stuck with me because I'm like, but y'all aren't really ready for that conversation. Like you think you are, but you're not. Um, so I guess my question is, where do you see or how does massage noir affect uh, fat black women within the black community? And then on a larger scale, how does it affect them outside of it? Because I guess people see what's happening in our community and I'm like, okay, well, it must be okay because they're treating this person like that and they're one of their own. So this is a, this is a fun question. Um, so I think, <laughs> this is me, this is, I think that, um, one, I think that diet culture is everywhere, mm -hmm. right? And I think that attitudes around bodies uh, infiltrate everywhere, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think white supremacy infiltrates everywhere. And I think that when you live within marginalized populations, you have a choice. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people within the Black collective have chosen, right, um, to also adopt diet culture and repurpose it for our culture. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, then what you get is you get thick, you get thick, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then you, you get fat, right? Um, you get BBWs, you get all of those things because, um, you know, we're not talking about a Jane Fonda's body, so to speak, right? Within the black community. Um, but we are talking about a Beyonce's body. Mm -hmm. um, Right. And the expectation that people should look like Beyonce. Like it's the same expectation that on the other side, people feel like somebody should look like Jennifer or what I say, Jane Fonda. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that um, massage noir as it relates to black women within the community shows up in that way that black men uh, in particular um, treat fat black women like shit, right? Um, because the information that they get from mainstream culture says that it's okay. That's reinforced within our culture when we have all these different categories, right? Thick, thick, fat, yeah. BW, or whatever, right? And so you see that based on this hierarchy of attractiveness, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if I, if I dare say, uh, fuckability, if yeah. you will, um, women are treated a particular type of way. Uh, and so you may have a fat woman who has a smaller waist, uh, but her body is voluptuous mm -hmm. and she may indeed be fuckable, but she's not relationship material. So mm -hmm. black men hide her, right? Behind a whole bunch of doors, right? And they only call her whenever they want, whatever they want. Right. Um, and they will openly make jokes about fat girls. They will, you know, they will ridicule her when they're angry, mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. And so there's this expectation of what it takes to keep a man um, or expectation. And I mean, like the doctrine is not just, the doctrine doesn't just reside with black men, mm -hmm. right? Like black women feel the same way, right? Mm -hmm. And so if, I talk about this in the book. If my, if my waist is, if my ass is in a certain shape, if my boobies don't sit up a certain way, right, then um, then who am I to expect that any man 
who's considered to be attractive by the collective should want to stay with me. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that's the mindset that you have, then you are going to start to think about ways by which you can get that to happen. Yeah. Right? Um, and I think that the disrespect that comes from Black men and Black women alike within the community as it relates to fat Black women, um, sometimes it's clear, right? Mm -hmm. um, we are desexualized by the people in our own collectives. Yeah. Uh, we are mammified by the people in our own collective. Mm -hmm. We are mean to our kids because of the size of their body. Um, you know, we say rude, harsh things um, to babies because of that. Uh, we have our own thoughts about, you know, how bodies become that way. Oh, they shouldn't be eating the cornbread. Oh, they shouldn't be eating this. And now with the rise of social media, right? Like everybody's on like Dr. Sebi's trade. Mm -hmm. right and um the acid that's in you that's in your body and alkaline and, and what it means to be vegan now and all of these things right um and it's not you know i mean i would love to think that people are like yeah it's about the environment all of this ain't about the environment y'all some of this is about you being smaller um and you getting smaller and this is how you're going to do it by adopting another diet mm -hmm. and so i think that that happens um, outside of the community, and let me know if I answered your question. No, you're, okay. I'm, I'm just like, yeah. okay. <laughs> so outside of the community, um, I mean, I think that people who use that, like, look at how they treat so-and-so, so we can treat them like that is a justification for people being jerks. Um, because I don't think that people are necessarily looking to make sure that it's okay with the black collective before they decide to mistreat somebody who's fat and black. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, black women and black fat women, black people as a whole have been disrespected at least in this country enough that signals to other people um, outside of the community that this is the norm, like this is for par. Right, and they, and it hasn't been that they've been mistreated by their own, they've been mistreated by people who are outside of their community, right? Um, and so I think that a lot of that kind of comes from or stems from that space of, you know, I can say whatever I wanna say to them, like yeah. what's gonna happen? Like, what are they gonna do? They can't, you know, they can't hurt me, they can't do this, right? But, yeah. you know, if somebody rise up on them and then throat check them and then it's another story, right? And so, um, and so, yeah, I think that there's a lot of, um, I mean, I think there's just a lot of trash, like yuck, because that's what it makes me feel like. That's why my face is twisted. Yeah. It's just yuck, right? Um, that goes, goes towards Black fat women. And I think that people will try their hardest to pull out of their, um, their arsenal ways that will hurt us um because we make other people feel uncomfortable right so if that's us in mini skirts if that's us sharing our thoughts um you know i heard somebody say like i'm like i'm a like i'm a good pick right like i shouldn't have to feel grateful like i should be able to choose yeah um and that makes people uncomfortable like what does she mean that she should be able to choose like because you feel like I shouldn't have a choice, right? Like a lot of people within the community, outside of the community, feel like black fat women should be grateful. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> right? <laughs> I feel about it. Like, whatever. Like, I'm not taking scraps because, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm just not. And I'm not going to be a lover in secret because me being out in the open makes you feel uncomfortable yeah boy okay whatever like now that we have after pay too let me go ahead and get my four payments somebody gonna ship me something i'm gonna be i'm gonna be straight Listen. right i'm gonna be okay right and, and and here's the boot i'm gonna do my after pay and get a camera and make sure that i take pictures that so that everybody can see it and i think that's a lot of like the fat activism fat you know fat acceptance that you see right now like people just are not apologetic about showing up in the world and it makes people uncomfortable yeah awesome well i have enjoyed this conversation thoroughly 
I love every second of it. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, I appreciate you all reaching out. Of course. Is there anything else that you would like to end um, where we can find your book, anything you have coming up or just like any final thoughts? Um, yeah, so you can visit my website at drjoycox.com. There's a link there for the book that I'll at least take you to like the master page of where the book gets sold. And there's several other, I mean, there's several um, retailers that you can choose from, including okay. independent bookstores. So whatever your choice is, I like to direct people there. Mm -hmm. um things that I have coming up I have some speaking engagements but I'm not sure that they're public okay but you can always stay tuned um you could follow me on fresh out the cocoon ig that's all one word which is also the name of my podcast (laughs) oh so you can check me out there um and I guess if there be anything else that I want to say to to people um particularly people who find themselves living in this reality that we're in right now what it means to be black and fat and and um and in a woman um and that's not just biologically uh mm-hmm. women is that you're enough you know i don't think that we hear that enough and when we hear it i don't think that we sit with it mm-hmm. enough right it's like you are enough as you are right now um right now in this moment right here you know, I've seen people in relationships that I'm like, how? Ma'am, you are enough, right? Like, <laughs> you are enough, right? I've been in boardrooms and organizations with people that I've worked with, and I've been like, how, mm-hmm. right? Um, so don't ever question, like, your worth or your value because somebody didn't pick you, right? Like, you're enough right now, and so you know, remind yourself of that, give yourself a hug when you need it, uh, and, and, and walk in that truth. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank um, you. You're welcome. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Enjoy the rest of your week. I will be waiting with bated breath for like the next book and the next podcast. So yeah, I'm just so glad that we were able to like to connect in this way.